the chair of the Dunedin City Council's Infrastructure Committee, um, Councillor Jim O'Malley. Jim, good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Oh, hi, Mike. It's good to be on. Thank you. Um, now, the reason I've asked you on the show, Jim, is um, obviously uh, Three Waters continues to be uh, a massive political issue throughout New Zealand to every council. And I guess from mm -hmm. your point of view and every other territorial authority that I can think of as well, the uncertainty isn't helping you. Um, but over the weekend, you, or rather your council, the Dunedin City Council, got stuck into the government um, over the reforms that they're planning and suggested that they are simply, or the legislation that's before the House is simply unworkable, and you made that in a submission to their Finance and Expenditure Committee. Um, it, and as I understand, you're going to discuss that, what, the submission tomorrow, are you, or are you making the submission to Parliament tomorrow? No, it's um, being, it's being discussed tomorrow, but, but we'll be making the submission on Thursday, so um, it is all this week. Right. And so, you're quite right. Um, in the first paragraph, we describe it as being fundamentally flawed. Yeah. Which is, so yeah. when you're talking about the legislation, you're talking about the bill that's already passed through, which I think is what do they call that, the Three Waters or the, the Water this Entities the water Bill. Service legislation bill. Yeah, yep. so that one's already been passed. That's now got royal assent. Oh. Yeah? Oh, no, this is the second one. This, this is the, the second doing, one. So the second one now, it's basically they're a pair. Yeah. The first one had lots of holes in it, like unanswered questions. So the second bill was supposed to answer the questions. And now that we've seen the second bill, we're like, <clears throat> you haven't answered the questions at all. And this stuff doesn't even make logical sense. Jim, what questions does the second bill fail to answer? Um, things around like the funding model and also really big things like district planning. I mean, I heard, you know, in your previous discussion, you're talking about um, hazards, like stormwater hazards. It's still not clear where the councils will be able to control um, how the stormwater investments go because now we'll go to these entities. So we will lose that in our district planning. Um, and that could have wicked consequences. Sorry, so just future. explain that to me again. Explain it to everybody else because this is new. We all knew that drinking water was included and we knew that sewage was included, wastewater. You're saying mm -hmm. now that stormwater, which I had understood hadn't moved yet into those water entities, is going to move with this legislation as their responsibility. Have I got that right? Yeah, well, this is, that's the third of the three waters. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And, and the real issue was when this first came up about well, three and a half, four years ago, council said, if you don't take stormwater, then you, then we've how we've got a rate for that, and and now we're going to be left behind with that, and it's not talking to the other two waters. So they either all stay or they all leave, was what we said at the start. And so they've decided you know, right to leave it all, though, to be honest. So this piece of legislation picks up stormwater and transfers it to the water entities. It continues with the legislation. The whole body of legislation has been doing that all along. Right. Well, except. Yep. Yeah, except for some territorial authorities, um, you'd know just south of you, Clutha, they say, well, so far the legislation only affects us when it comes to drinking water. Um, but I don't know why they think that, but that's what I don't know think. why they would think that. I guess the point is they may not have much of a pipe stormwater system. Yeah, a I, I, rural su area. I suspect that's so what it is. So it's a relatively yeah. simple stormwater system for them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, a lot of their drinking water for the majority of their constituents is not reticulated, I think, or at least a good proportion. And if of you're not well. reticulated, you're not covered by this legislation. Although, if you're on rural water schemes, they are considered reticulated, so they get covered. But if you're a house that's just got a well, yeah, you're not covered by this legislation. Um, or a or a septic tank. Yep. So if I'm you're not if you're not connected to a reticulated system, you're not covered by this legislation at all. And I think a lot of people are confusing that. Mm. thinking that, that they are. Mm. And that's also that, you know, that number the government bandied around about 30,000 people being made sick by drinking water. That's an extrapolated number coming from an actual number of 5,500. And it's all, none of it's reticulated water. It's all people on their own systems that are being made sick. Right, right. Uh, which is an important yeah, yeah, point to make. That's not what's covered by this legislation. Yeah. So they're using a number that doesn't even relate to what they doing, which it, that's where the frustration has been all along, to be honest. Um, one of the criticisms of Nationals' policy over the weekend was that they hadn't done any costing. So whatever the system, both the one that we're talking about now in front of the government and the one that the National Party are proposing, um, doesn't actually suggest what the costs are likely to be of any new entity in upgrading water systems. Do you think that's a fair criticism or not? Oh. <laughs> I 
say the criticism I would have would be that any number that has been brought out there has been brought out there to suit the argument of whoever's saying it. So Infrastructure New Zealand, Water New Zealand and the government are saying it's going to cost $180 billion to repair and build the current three water systems over the next 50 to 60 years. But we've just done our asset management plan to the new standards and we've valued our assets at $2.4 billion. Now, if you say Auckland's 10 times bigger than us, then that's $24 billion, which means you're talking around about $78 billion for the total asset value of the current, all the three waters in New Zealand. So where they get the $180 billion from, I have no idea. No, they just made it up. And they just made it up and they made it such a big number, it sounds so frightening that they're like, you won't be able to cover that. Whereas if you look at our particular plan, if we write that, that $2.4 billion over 50 years, it's $48 million a year. Mm. And and that's quite literally inside our capacity to do that. Mm. And it's it's a step up of about another $20 million from what we used to do. And we've realised that. We've been underestimating the asset. That's why you're seeing all those cones around town. We're getting into it now. And we're meeting the new regulations right now. So we're at the point of saying, where is this crisis that you've suddenly decided you've got to take these assets and aggregate them? Mm. Which is exactly what Auckland and uh, Canterbury have been saying as well because they've come up with new water systems as well to meet their particular needs too. That said, yes. the government are not convinced. Chris Hipkins has doubled down over this since he's become Prime Minister. He said, no, we're still going to carry on this way. We may change some of the wording, but the entities um, themselves will still be established. Um, and I guess that's what you're fighting. Uh, 100%, and that's what we've been fighting from the very start. And it's got conflated with all other things that went along. The co-governance debate was actually was added quite uh, quite late in the de design of this. It was brought in after, because this started in the last year of national and government, and then co-governance came in later as part of it. And then everybody focused on that, and they forgot to look at the actual underlying economic model, which is seriously flawed. Um, so we got set off in that direction and we didn't get back to look at the model. This bill is directly about the model and it's, it looks terrible. Um, now, you can go to the Finance Expenditure Committee and I guess waste your time and your money because you know that they're going to do it anyhow. I guess you've got to be seen to represent your constituents and you've got to be seen to point out what you believe to be the truth, which is fair enough. Jim... You're not the mayor and you're not the deputy mayor, so you've got a bit more terms of independence of thought. Um, you don't have to parrot the, um, the party line. Your thoughts of changing the government's view on this prior to the election? Um, well, I, st I still do have to do, deal with council resolutions and resolutions of council, but the bottom line is we're actually all pretty much in agreement with you know, what we're facing here. And... Um, our hope really is that we can get the government to understand that this could very well cost them the election. And um, if if they choose to go ahead with this, then they have to agree that, that they may lose the election over this point. And we have looked at this with, we think, clear and open eyes and say, you know, it's 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 fixable. There is an alternative ways to do this to achieve the overarching objectives that you want to achieve, but you have to come back to us to talk to us so we can help you fix it. And if you insist on going in the direction you're going to go in, basically our submission says this, you're not going to save any money. It's going to cost a hell of a lot more for the council now to have to deal with an entity sitting inside it as opposed to its own department. So the rates will, while our water bill is 1100 it will go to 1700 and you might get 1100 off your rates, but then we're going to have to put 400 back in because we're going to have to deal with an entity inside the council. So the households are not going to see any savings at all. Mm. So uh, why are you going ahead with this? Why are you going ahead with this, is mm. what I'd say. Mm. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you actually a quote from the eighth section of our introduction. It says, despite the council's opposition to the proposed reforms and its view that there are better ways to achieve the desired outcomes, it is evident that the government has steadfastly refused to listen throughout the reform process. However, Council has the overriding obligation to the ratepayers now to set out our further submissions on the bill for consideration. So we say it right there. You aren't listening to us. You're not listening. You're not going to listen to us this time. But we have an obligation to the ratepayers to at least say this. Mm. No, fair enough. Yeah. Um, you've seen the National Party's uh, policy come out over the weekend. I'm sure you've looked at that in some detail. Mm -hmm. What's your mm -hmm. initial impression of that? 
still not really addressing the concept of balance sheet separation and, and the idea that if you set up an entity and it goes out and gets a whole heap of debt, somehow you're immune from it because you're not. And I think they really, again, I would say back to them, actually go and assess all 67 councils for what their actual burden is. And I think you'll find there's less than 10 who are in trouble. So that probably is one of them. Um, and why don't we just talk about fixing them first and then stick into the new regulations as they come out on the Tamata ROI? Because we know we can. Invercargill knows it's can, because I, I know the chair of infrastructure down there quite well, Ian Pottinger. Um, I, I know Pauline Cotter up in Christchurch. We all talk about our, what we need to face, and we're all like, we can face this. We can meet this. So there's only a handful of councils that can't. Mm. And it's costing two billion to set this stupid thing up. Mm. Mm. Well, no, they're recruiting staff. Them. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and also, if you think it's going to get any better and any cheaper, they're recruiting the same staff who are operating now. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. So a, a lot of this doesn't make sense. So I really would even say to National, just come back one more step and say, why why are you, why aren't you treating the debt in an appropriate way? Look and see whether or not councils can even cover it. So we're nowhere near our 3.5 um, income to debt ratio. I think we're at like 1.8. Right. So we could take on a substantial more debt and still be well inside the safety margin of what's considered safe. And I think that's where I get back to this whole catastrophizing is where was the crisis? Um, it's interesting you've raised Clutha, though, because Clutha is a disaster. Um, and it's <coughs> been a disaster uh, for a long time in terms of yep. its water management and its responsibilities. You almost wonder, don't you, is the, is the solution the bigger ones like Dunedin that has a better balance sheet and have assets that you can call on to absorb some of those smaller councils? Um, is, there, is there some sort of logic and aggregation in terms of providing well, water? Before I did that, I would actually say to them, why are you carrying no <coughs> debt at all? Mm. Like, Clutha has no debt at all. Mm. And large capital spends have to be debt funded. So we're carrying debt for our large capital spends. So before I went into whether or not they genuinely can or can't afford it, I'd want to have a closer look as whether it's simply that they don't want to pay for it. So that's a slightly different question. Yeah. Um, and then the other one is I, I would like us to be going through what would you call an Otago South and cooperative model. So our reticulated systems don't overlap. Um, maybe one day if the need got bigger, we might have to draw... Um, out of Waipori, which would mean we were drawing out of the Clutha district. But generally speaking, each district runs its own system inside its own boundaries. So there's no real great advantage of aggregation. So you'd only be talking about cost spreading. Um, but we could look at expertise spreading. So a big water office in Dunedin, fairly large one in Queenstown, and a large one in Invercargill. And the smaller councils pay into those water offices. So when they need a special design, they don't have to get contractors, they can get you know, the Invercargill offices design it for them or the Dunedin office design, design it for them. And then we go in as aggregate group buyers. So all of Otago and Southland buys its stuff in, yeah, yeah. as a single buyer yeah. to get the best best price we can for it. Yeah. And when you look at that, that's all that the DIA model is actually suggesting these entities are going to achieve. They, they now are admitting that the entities are not even going to get better interest rates than us mm. Mm. on their debt. Mm. So... Yeah, and part of it would be to say to bring them up to speed, I think it would require a central government spend of maybe five or six billion. But in the last election, they threw out six billion just before the election as an infrastructure spend to, to seats they wanted to get votes in. Yeah, no, it's a fair point you raise. Uh, I guess, though, for that five yeah. or six billion dollars, they're going to want to get some degree of leverage or at least political control to make sure that they don't waste it. Oh, well, yeah, the leverage is to the ROI, the regulator. This regulator's got a lot of power. Mm. And, and, and it's a very powerful regulator, and nobody objected to it coming. The district health boards were not able to be the regulator for health and safety. They didn't have the expertise inside. So Tamata Arawai has that expertise. We're all happy with that. No council objected to that. And those are the new standards that you have to live to. And we had to put an extra $7 million operating budget into our budget for meeting those new standards. No, fair enough. And we did, and now we're meeting them. Jim, thank you. We'll keep an eye on this because this is not going away, as you say. You're expecting, obviously, this to be a significant election issue and you say that the government could actually lose the election just on this one issue. Well, it's going to cost them at least 3%. Do they want to give that up? We'll see. When they don't have to. I guess that's what I'm trying to get yeah, into yeah. their head no. to saying. There is a different way to do this. Yeah.
Thank you very much, Jim. Nice to yep. talk to you. Have a good day. And, um, yeah, look forward to seeing how that turns out.